What's up, guys? Next episode, new episode of Road Dogging. Some of y'all already see my guest here. Um, this is the famous homeless fisherman, as y'all know him on Instagram, Marshall Arnwine. What is up, dog? How's it going, everybody? I, I'm glad to be here on Road Dogging. Very excited. Very excited. I was uh, super excited. I mean, this is, uh, y'all know that have been watching Road Dog. Um, most of what we've done so far is, is kayak tournament guys. And obviously that's kind of my strength of who to talk to. And that's the most people that I know, but this is one of the things I wanted to have when road dogging kind of came to mind is guys that are out living and breathing, fishing, uh, Marshall's living out of his van. I ain't gonna, I ain't gonna take too much of a story away. I want him to explain it all, but this is one of the most, uh, this is one of the things I was really striving for when we got started with this. Um, you know, Mar Marshall has a huge following. He's got like 50,000 people on his Instagram. And I was excited when he sent me a text that he can make it on the podcast. And I was, I was ecstatic. So, uh, Marshall, introduce yourself, tell us how you got into fishing and we'll start rolling from there. All right. Uh, like I said, my name is Marshall and, uh, I've been fishing, Pretty much ever since, I mean, I have, I have kind of the generic, like, you know, my dad took me fishing kind of story. Um, I'm, I've always been a big, like critter guy. I love animals. I love catching snakes, reptiles, stuff like that. Um, you probably see that content kind of mix into my other stuff too. I try and post about it a, a bunch, but, uh, I, when I was little, like probably around eight or nine years old, I want to say, um, I, we used to live pretty close to this lake. It was like a real quick bike ride. I could run down the lake and, um, you know, I go down the lake, catch crawdad snakes, and then I walk down on the dock. And I remember walking down on the dock, and people had these big, giant freshwater drum that they were catching, like those big gas burgoons. And I remember just walking up, like, "Hey, can I touch that?" And they would let me touch it, and I poke it. And then I was like, "I was like, dude, I gotta, I gotta pick up more of these. Like, I gotta figure out how to get these. You know what I mean? Because that was like my thing is going around and just picking up stuff. You know, whether it's snakes, crawdads, fish, whatever, right? So I was like, Dad, you gotta take me fishing. And I and I hounded him for a while, and my dad's never been a big fisherman. He's more of a hunter for sure. Um, but he, he knows how to wet a line, you know? So, so we went to Walmart, we got some, uh, we got some little cheapo Zebco poles, put a worm on it with a split shot, just set it on the side of the dock and watch the tip go and caught some bluegill. And that was it, dude. Ever since then, just like as much as I can, um, getting out there fishing, um, translated into bass fishing, uh, right before high school, probably when I was like 13 or 14. Um, and I started fishing the T the THSBA tournaments. Uh, we have a really good high school, uh, team trail in, uh, in, in Texas, which is, which is awesome. I'm really, we're really blessed to have that. And, uh, I had a partner that had a boat. I didn't have much, but, but I had a boat. I was like, Hey man, can I hop on? Let's go fish. And, and we, we ended up doing pretty good. Um, I'm actually four, four time state champion qualifier for the Azle high school bass fishing team. So I made championships, uh, every year, which was cool. That's um, awesome. Yeah, my little my little achievement there. <laughs> <laughs> so where uh so your your high school uh, uh if you want to say that again, what was kind of like your lake that you kind of grew up fishing or, or body of water? Yeah, so uh Eagle Mountain Lake is my home lake. That's the lake that was really close to my house. Um I would just ride down there after school and stuff like that and fish it. Um it used to not be like a uh, super good lake. I mean, it, it's always been pretty good. Like you could go there and throw a square bill and a, and a spinner rate and produce really well. Um, but I remember for the longest time, the lake record there was always like 11 pounds. It was like 11 on the dot or 11, four or something. And, Which is uh, low for Texas, right? I mean, that's low in the grand scheme of Texas. It is low for Texas, right. And this record stayed like that forever. All of, like all my youth growing up and just recently, I think it was two years ago, not even maybe, maybe it was last year. Um, they caught a 16, they caught a 16 out of Eagle mountain. So now the record is like 16 and a half. That's which, raising the bar incredibly. Oh, no, it, it's crazy. Cause those fish have like, do they literally like, they just inflate it. I don't know what happened, but now it seems like everybody's like, Oh dude, you can just go there and catch tens, you know, like Eagle mountain. Uh, I still have not got a 10 out of Eagle mountain, which honestly hurts my soul. I have so many that were like <laughs> really close, like high nines, but it just hadn't happened yet. I'm hoping when I go back, I'll be able to, I'll be able to get one. Uh, but all my buddies have tens out of Eagle Mountain, so it's just kind of, you know, that was it. But yeah, Azel High School next to Eagle Mountain there, and um, yeah, I just grew up fishing that lake, and it was a really, it was like a, 
I don't know. Eagle Mountain is very interesting because it's like a, a shallow water fishery for sure. So you really had to just get up there and like use your senses. Like you couldn't, even if you're fishing off a boat, which I was not, I was fishing off like a kayak and stuff. Yeah. Um, but you can't, you can't just like use the graph and go look at fish and go catch them. Like, dude, they're up shallow. Like they get up shallow. You go throw spinner bait, crank bait, stuff like that. That's, and, that sounds like my kind of place right there. Where's this place at? Is that East Texas, <laughs> West Texas? North, North Texas, like right in the DFW area. Um, yeah. it's a fun lake, but it'll, it'll, it'll whoop your ass. That's for sure. I, I, I can tell you that one uh, that are just rough. Um, but like I said, it produces pretty good, but it was a good lake to cut my teeth on for sure. Um, Absolutely. that's where I started. That's where I started fishing originally. Um, so this is like a, how I got into like kayak fishing really. Um, I started out in a kayak. I wasn't always in the paddleboard, but, um, I remember we had uh, Chris Saldane. So he actually lives in Azel, right? Or his wife, his wife grew up in Azel, went to Azel High School. And so he would come to the to, to the school and do little talks with us and stuff. And I remember like, I had like the, the privilege of like going and having lunch with Chris. And it was just, it was just like mind blowing from a little 14 year old self. And absolutely. And, yeah. I went in there and I, I talked to him and I, and I was kind of, I was interested in swim baits at the time. And I, you know, uh, Chris is a big bait guy. Right. And yeah. Back and I was just like, dude, like, tell me, tell me about it. Right. Like, how do you do it? Like, what do you do? And I was just on the shore at the time. And, um, he was telling me his PB story. He caught a 14 pounder on a Huddleston out of a float tube. And he was sitting there telling me this story. And he just like looked at me at the end of the story. And he's like, he's like, Marshall, remember if you can float, you're deadly. And that line has stuck with me up until this day. I never forget that every time I go out on the water and I'm like, man, I wish I had a boat, man. I wish I had this, like whatever. And then I'm like, <laughs> no, that's not true. Like I am just deadly enough in my rig. You know what I mean? Like whatever yeah. you got, it's a float tube, an inflatable paddleboard, an inner tube, like whatever you got, if you can float, you're deadly. That's, that's the name of the game right there. You know, I'm going to, we're going to have to put that up in, in kite fishing <laughs> on kite bass nation or something. If you can float, you're deadly. It doesn't matter what it is. Like we've had guys, like we've had three national tournaments this year and none of them have been live scope, you know, dominated events. Mm -hmm. And the the guy that won our first event in Florida was was paddling, if I'm not mistaken. So um, that's that's, I, that's awesome. That's a great line. We're gonna have to use that. If you, if you can float, you're deadly. <laughs> I really I really respect the guys that can, and not not disrespect to anybody who does it with the graphs and stuff. That's fun. That's that's a lot of fun to go out there and live scope. Them. I get it, but I for me, my own like personal game. That's the thing about fishing is it's like. Uh, if you're not doing tournament fishing, like the kind of stuff that I do, like trophy hunting, it's a you versus you kind of sport. At the end of the day, when you go out on the water, nobody else is hindering you but yourself. It's like, it's really akin to sports like skating or, or BMX and stuff like that. You know what I mean? Where the only one stopping you from doing that trick is you, is your own mental block. You know what I mean? You just have to go out there and do it. And yeah. fishing is the same way for me. So when I get to go out there and if I catch a big fish, right, it's kind of like landing, like I said, it's like landing a skate trick, right? So if I catch it on a cool bait, that's like plus the trick. If I catch it without a graph, that's plus the trick. If I catch it on a paddleboard, plus the, you know what I mean? So it adds up. It's like, it's like skating a line. You know what I mean? If you're going to like grind the ledge and do the kickflip on the rail, like, you know, what I mean? it all adds up to one trick, which is cool. That's what I, that's what I really, I really value in my fishing is going out and just making something happen. That's like a one-off, you know what I mean? Stuff that happens yeah. that doesn't happen every day. I want to go out there and try something new and, and maybe fish an area where nobody else is getting to, you know what I mean? In a style that no one else is doing. I really enjoy that. You know what I mean? I don't have to, I don't have to go out and catch a whole bunch of fish. I don't have to go out and catch like, you know, the biggest one in the lake, but if I can make something cool happen that day, I, that's a good day for me, you know? And, and you've had some awesome clips. I know a lot of the, the guys that I've talked to have, have watched your videos and we've seen them um, you've got an awesome figure eight video, like a, around a dock where you caught just a giant. Um, <laughs> you, you've got some really cool videos uh, throwing um, uh, flea shads where, where you're burning flea shads and you're chilling on your paddleboard and, and you're catching just giants. And it just um, some of the snakehead videos you posted recently are really cool where you can see fish kind of dart out after after the after the bay. And the videography is fantastic of just cool stuff, like you mentioned. <laughs> That's what I like, man. I like cool stuff. I, I'm pretty like, when it comes down to it, I'm really basic. I'm like kind of like a little kid in my head. If I see something that's cool, I'm gonna be like, like whoa, like I, I need to do that. You know what I mean? Like, I watch. Yeah. A, I don't watch a whole lot of TV, but like when I do, I go watch. Like, I really like Godzilla movies, and that to me is just like the ultimate <laughs> epitome. Like, 
that's awesome. It's a big giant lizard breathing fire. And it's the same way in fishing. Like, dude, if I have a freaking huge bass come out and crush a top water, come on, what's cooler than that? You know, <laughs> like, yeah. that's, 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 there's nothing cooler than that. You know, and bringing out that like little kid inside of you, you know, it's fun. Well, while I'm thinking of it, you mentioned lizards and that might be not exactly correct, but you want to, you want to tell us about your, about your pet. I'm going to put him up here on the screen so everybody can see him, but, but tell us about your, your companion on the water. Yeah. So, uh, I actually don't live in the van alone. This is, uh, this is Mr. Archie right here. Archie is my, my number one partner in crime. He is the, he's the captain of the homeless pirates. He really helps me get out there, sniff out the bass. You know how it is. <laughs> it's a, it's a really good, it's a fun, it's a fun relationship. I actually, um, I rehomed him. So he was like a rescue, basically just somebody was giving him up and I was like, man, like, all right. Like I, I, I liked him. He was really cool. I went and visited and, um, I was like, dude, all right, let's do this. I, I, I kind of did the research and I got the stuff together and he likes to go out, hang out in the sun. Hey, I like to go out and hang out in the sun. So it works out really well. He sits, on the, front of, he sits on the front of my board. He's basking, getting the rays, you know, and he gets to go see the world, which I think is cool. And it's nice to have a little companion, of course, you know. Absolutely. And you, and you, a lot of times you'll like be showing him baits and be like, what do you think of this Archie and, and stuff like that? And you'll <laughs> feed him. I got a little clip playing of him, of him chilling up there in the sun. Yep. Yeah. No, he loves, he loves looking at the baits, like anything that's like really bright colored or like worms and stuff like that. He's always very interested in it, you know? And, uh, yeah, I try and feed him out there on the paddle board. So he's having a good time, you know what I mean? Gets to eat and then chill in the sun. Um, I think he, I think he really enjoys it. Uh, I, I get a lot of, a lot of like the PETA crew comments, you know, Oh, like the bearded dragon isn't supposed to swim and supposed to do whatever, but he's having a good time. He's healthy. He doesn't have any problems. I get him checked out. You know, I feed him right. Um, I think people forget that I, I love him. You know what I mean? Like, I'm yeah, not just, yeah, he, so. he's a pet, just like anybody, anybody else's dog or cat or anything that hangs out with him, hangs out with you on the, on the board. It's, it's, it's awesome. I mean, it's, there's, there's yeah. not too many people, you know, there's not too many people with dogs hanging out with them, you know, on, on kayaks and stuff, but to have uh, a bearded dragon, that's just chilling there and, and hanging yeah. out and lo looking at baits and, uh, trying to get the worm out of a fish's mouth when you're taking selfies with the with the fish. I mean that that is incredible to me. I mean that is some road dog excellence right there. Hey man, something something in life that I think everyone needs to experience is uh, is fishing or whatever whatever you like to do, whatever your hobby is with your pet. There's just something like there is something so like I don't know. It just feels down to earth. You know what I mean? When you go out there and you catch a fish and your pet's there to enjoy it with you, and then they might not even. Archie probably doesn't give a shit. He's like, whatever, man. You know, he doesn't know what's going on, but yeah. I, it's good for me. You know what I mean? It's nice to get out there and he's like, all right, cool. He's all stimulated. And uh, I think, I think that's a good experience that a lot of people should have now, you know, take your dog out there. <laughs> so, um, you're, you're recording tonight. You mentioned, uh, from your, from your van, tell us kind of how you're, how you're rock and rolling, you know, living the, living the road dog lifestyle and kind of tell us where you're at right now. Yeah, so I have a 1996 uh, Ford Ecoline 150. There she is right there. Uh, Ethel is her name. And, Ethel, uh, I love it. <laughs> that's uh, that's actually the, the name of the first bass that was ever put in the Texas Parks and Wildlife Share Lunker program. Uh, it was like a it was like a 17 or 18 pounder, which is a pretty cool, pretty cool little fact there for anyone who didn't know. But um, yeah, she has a whole lot of miles. And, uh, she's got a whole lot more to go. That's for sure. But Absolutely. I just have it rigged out. You know, I got a bed in here. I got like my blinds. I can put them down at night. Got my lights, got Archie's heat pad and everything is tank. Uh, I got a fridge in the front. Uh, it runs off alternator power. So I charge a couple batteries in the back while I'm driving. I also have a solar panel on top. So it all charges, keep my batteries going, uh, keeps me moving. Ethel definitely is the like life force of all my adventures. Um, she just, I, I swear she, she just runs on willpower. <laughs> like, like, <laughs> it's, it's that's going. that's your pirate ship for your paddleboard pirate, right? That uh, man, this is this is the mothership. So, yeah, that's how I do it. I just I send it, and I trust I trust Ethel to get me where I'm going. And if she's got a problem, we fix it, and we keep going. You know, that's it. <laughs> got to keep trucking. So, that's awesome. So, uh, you said you're in, uh, Florida right now. Is that just, uh, outside Gainesville and you've been down there, what, a couple of weeks, give or take. Uh, I've actually been down here since, uh, December 20th. Uh, oh, actually, wow. So a couple months. Yeah. yeah. A couple months. Yeah. I've been there for a while and, 
mainly to come down here because it's a lot like South Florida is a lot warmer in the wintertime, mainly for Archie. So we don't have to be freezing up there in Texas, but um, it's also cool to come down here, you know, catch some snakeheads, some new species, do some fun stuff. And then, you know, obviously the great bass fishing here in Florida. Um, oh, yeah. I love it. It's, it's definitely tricky. And a lot of people don't give Florida the credit it deserves. They're just like, Oh, you can just pull up and catch an eight pounder in whatever ditch, you know, that is not how it is. If you get down here and you go grind on your own, like you will find out very fast that that is not how it is. I, I come down here and like I said, I'm pretty stubborn. So I'm not like hitting people up being like, Hey dude, can I come fish this spot? Like, can you take me fishing? Like, dude, I literally came down here the entire month of January. I didn't fish with anybody and I just grinded. I was just like looking on the maps, fishing what looked good. And it took forever. It took forever to, if you were watching the vlogs, if anybody was watching the vlogs, you know that it was not, they're not good. Like the first few ones are just like no fish, you know what I mean? Me walking around. Easily. But finally, I think I got a good milk run together and uh, I found some good bass, caught a couple. I think the biggest one I caught was uh, seven and a half pounds uh, the other day. And I caught a whole bunch of six pounders, five, six pounders, which is dope. Um, yeah, it definitely, it finally paid off enough working, uh, but it feels good to know that I kind of came down here and did it on my own. You know what I mean? I didn't have to ask anybody. Um, I, I like that for myself. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. Go- do you, uh, do you do, uh, I, when we go down there for tournaments, one of my favorite things around like the Disney area, we seem to kind of gravitate towards like the Harris chain when we come down there for events. Do you ever do any like roadside, like side of the interstate, just grab a rod, no, no paddleboard. That's one of my most fun things down there is just hopping out of the yeah. truck, like cars going by and just, just trying to catch a big one on a glide man there's there's some really good spots that are like that i actually caught um a pretty good snook down in south florida just fishing this random little canal that i was like i thought there were snook in it i had like i was like maybe because it is kind of connected to the ocean like i could see how they could get there maybe jump over one dam and it's kind of just like and i just happened to catch like a nice you know like a 28 like a 28 29 inch snook which is not a massive one but for a little canal, solid one yeah yeah for a canal it's super fun and yeah, I managed to pull a couple of six pounders out of a little canals, which is really cool. Walking those canals is so much fun. That is definitely a wild experience that you can only get down here. And you're just walking and there's big giant iguanas jumping in the water. There's a you know, ten foot alligator over there hanging out. It's wild. It's fun. <laughs> does, does Archie play nice with the iguanas? No, actually. He wants to fight <laughs> the iguana that he sees. He I don't know if you've ever I don't know if you've ever seen a bearded dragon go into like territorial mode. Their beard gets completely pitch black and they start head bobbing they're like bobbing around but uh we were we were hanging out in the parking lot just chilling (laughs) and i was editing some videos and i had him in the cage and he starts getting all mad in the cage and i'm like what is going on over there so i come and i look and i open up the window and i'm looking for birds because usually birds kind of make him mad right i'm looking i'm looking dude like 30 yards out there there's this little green iguana just walking on the ground real chill and he wanted to fight he wanted to get out and he wanted to wrestle he wasn't about it at all which is pretty funny so he just like just doing his head bobbing thing so no he doesn't he doesn't get along with the iguanas at all so archie archie stands on business when it comes to other small (laughs) small animals he's a he's a solo critter that's for sure it's it's me and nobody else (laughs) (laughs) that's awesome so, um, so you're in a paddleboard. Is it an inflatable paddleboard as well, or is it or is it pl- a plastic? Yeah. So mine, mine is inflatable. I actually have it sitting right here behind my passenger or behind my driver's seat. Um, it just fits into a backpack. I roll it out. I have a little electric pump. Pump it up, and uh, it's like a. I don't know if anybody's ever like if you haven't ever felt one, they kind of seem daunting because you're like, oh, this is just gonna pop after a hook. They're like yeah. a be a drop stitch material so they're really tough like if you to get a hook in there you'd have to like really try and drive it in you know what i mean like it would be tough yeah. and i i have little pinholes in mine that like kind of leak if you pour water on it you can see bubbles coming out but whatever it's a cheapo from amazon i don't really spend a that's lot what of- i was going to ask if you had like a preferred uh, inflatable no, paddleboard kind of well, i go on amazon i find one that is the specs and color that i like and i order it like under 200 dollars. i just i don't even worry about it <laughs> I like, I like the cheap stuff cause I can beat it up. And then also this is like a little, uh, thing that I figured out is that the more expensive boards are usually more expensive because they're double drop stitch PVC. So they're double the weight. So if you buy the one drop stitch, they're a lot lighter. So I think mine only weighs like 17 pounds total. So this is like a super duper light rig, which is perfect because if I'm trying to like hike into a lake that no one's been to before, I can literally throw this thing on my back 
pick up my milk crate and just hike it like a mile, drop it on the ground and inflate it. And it's not even like, you know, it's like, of course I'm carrying this big thing on my bag, but it's not, it's yeah. not terrible. I can do it. You know what I mean? I can, it, it unlocks a lot of water for me that a lot of people can't. Oh fit. yeah. Yeah. Cause even like with my kayak, I feel like I can get into a lot of places, but I mm -hmm. still need like, even with my smaller kayaks, like I either like throw it in the back of the truck or like most of the time it's on a trailer. So like I have to go somewhere where I can get like a trailer too, and then I can throw <laughs> wheels under the kayak and, and get it to somewhere. But that's, you know, having an inflatable kayak that you're literally just hiking around a mile with it on your back is yeah. you know, like, a whole nother ball game <laughs> i can get i can get damn near anywhere i'll tell you that like there's not there is not a spot that i don't think i can get to um honestly the best like example of that is probably the first time i ever fished off a paddleboard um so me and my buddy juan we there's this lake that i'm not going to name in texas that is a very private very expensive lake to fish <laughs> it costs fifteen hundred dollars a day to fish right and apparently there's wow. a world they stock it they load it up and, and they feed the fish and everything like that. Right. And I was like, dude, we got to go fish this lake, but I'm not paying $1,500. Right. right. And, so we're, and we're, we're on Amazon and we're looking, we're like, we're like, man, how can we fish this lake? What can we bring in, you know, pack it in like inflatable and take it in there and just fish it around real quick at night and then leave. And we're looking like inner tube, da, 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 float tube. And then I was like, boom, dude, look at this inflatable paddleboard. It's $150. It's like a little bitty thing. It fits in a backpack. This is perfect. It's got a hand pump. So we ordered a couple paddle boards. And like I said, first time fishing off a paddleboard, never done this before. We throw them on our back. We, pike, we, we hike in like two miles, right? We park way, way away, hike in two miles, <laughs> jump over this like 20 foot game fence. Like this thing will stop antelope from jumping over it. We like climb up and throw the boards over it. We, we pump them up there on the shore. It's like 11 o'clock at night. And we fish around this lake and we skunk. It was the it was like the worst night of fishing ever. I was like, dude, we walked all the. <laughs> I was like, and I imagine if we would have paid fifteen hundred dollars to come fish here and catch nothing. So, those fish but, are probably really smart. Oh yeah, probably. Or they just don't eat at night. Maybe that was the thing. But <laughs> they all get fed in the day. But uh, yeah, I was fishing, and I kind of was just sitting there on the board, and I was like, man, I can put my legs in the water, and I can like turn, you know what I mean, and I can angle the front of my board with my legs, and I don't even have to stop reeling. I don't have to pick up the paddle. And I was sitting there and I, I was like, man, that was really nice. I like that. It was really lightweight, easy to maneuver. And so the next time we went fishing, we brought the kayaks out. Right. And then we were like, okay, cool, whatever. And then the next time I was like, Hey dude, you want to take the paddle boards out again? Just on the big lake. And he was like, yeah, let's do that. And then we never picked up the kayaks ever again after that. We were just <laughs> like, dude, this is it. Uh, we started kind of like getting a technique down for it. You know what I mean? Like do a little bit of yoga, stretching out the hamstrings and the quads and all that and dropping in and you have so much control now it's not for you know like you got to be like decently athletic to fish off a paddle board at least the way i do it um yeah. like i like a narrower board because it's easier to straddle and control but you can literally kick counterclockwise and clockwise to turn the nose of your board even kick a little bit forward to hold in the wind and i never have to let off my reel like you know how when you're in a kayak and you kind of if you don't have pedal drive you're just kind of floating all over the place. You know, you're picking up the paddle halfway through your retrieve. You're just fumbling yeah. around it's any sort of windy. It's not a fun day, but on the paddle board, it almost completely eliminates a lot of that stuff. And I also think that it is probably the number one, most stealthy way to get around and the most efficient way, just because there's nothing more quiet than you pedaling with your feet. You know what I mean? It's, it's yeah. quieter than pedal drive, quieter than any trolling motor, any whatever. Um, it is the ultimate form of fishing to me. And I, I really think that um, I'm going to catch the world record on my paddleboard. That's what's going to happen. That's the goal. <laughs> so, that's, that's awesome. That's the move, man. <laughs> so do you do you ever, um, somebody asked me when I told you you were coming on that are like, like you have to ask this question. Do you never like get concerned with alligators when you're, when you're on the paddleboard, like in Florida and Texas, like kicking around like that? Does, does that ever cross your mind? No, nope. I, I mean, I see them and they're on the bank and we, we chill together. Um, uh, for me, I don't care. Like for me, I think that I have the ultimate fishing technique and I'm going to catch the world record doing this. And if, if this is it, if I have to put myself in danger a little bit, then so be it. You know what I mean? Like that to me is worth the big fish. I'm just not, just not worried about it. Um, like I said, I'm going to catch the world record or I'm going to die trying. That's it. Um, but legit, yeah, legit. For, 
for the most part, gators, dude, they, they are not the things you need to worry about. I'd probably worry about crocodiles. I'd be a little more worried about them. Maybe bull sharks if I knew, right? But gators are are like the one of the least likely things for you to be attacked by. Um, the, to give you some numbers, I, I looked up the numbers because everybody in me every day, dude, alligators. Oh, this is a constant question. <laughs> you're going to get your leg bitten off. But uh, I saw, I was like, okay, let me look at the stats on this, right? So between 1948 and 2022, I think 200 alligator attacks, like 250 somewhere in there, happened in Florida, right? Total. And that's 80 years, 200 attacks, and 20 people died, right? 20, 21 people. Eight of those people were infants, right? They were like little babies. So this to put this in perspective, right? Those 80 years, it took, to, it, it took 80 years for alligators to kill 21 people, right? And 19 people died from getting struck by lightning in just the year 2022 alone. So you literally have a 100 times more chance to just go outside and get struck by lightning and die, right? That's it. Like you're just done. It just hand of God snaps you out of existence right there. That's a hundred times more likely than you getting bit by alligator and dying. And then don't even get me started on the car crash fatalities, right? You get yeah. in your car single day. That is like the number one way to die. So if you're worried about a gator killing you, that's like one of the least of your concerns. I, I get scared driving around in Florida. Like, you know what I mean? On yeah. 70, oh God, this is freaky. Like this is, that's where you're going to die. <laughs> See, I, the reason I asked that question is because I have an alligator incident in the, in the kayak. Really? We, we were in South Louisiana and, uh, pe people love hearing this story because, um, I don't know if you've ever like redfish, like around Venice or anything in, in South Louisiana, but I, I, you've been so, in that area. So, you know, like, uh, we were in, um, we were in Venice. I don't know, just basically in that general area. And, uh, we, we had put in this little mud launch area that wasn't kind of an official boat launch. And we probably went, you know, a mile or so away from the launch. And there was six of us that were down there and we kind of split up in pairs, you know, cause we were worried about alligators. And so, you know how there's like little channels and cuts through the reeds that you kind of go and look for redfish, you know, real shallow. <laughs> And I was in one of those little cuts and I was in my Hobie PA 14 and it was probably, you know, 14 foot wide, give or take the, this little cut. And, um, sitting there just kind of easing around. I got my Mirage drive. I'm kind of pedaling through all stealthy, like looking for, for, for tails, you know? And, uh, I hit something with my pedals and it turned me completely backwards, like in just a snap of the finger. Right. And, you know, I'm a big dude. I'm not too worried about a whole lot, you know, and I'm like, I immediately, when that happens, everybody thinks they're a pretty bad dude until something, you know, <laughs> sketchy happens. And well, it turns out when I hit an alligator with my kayak and it turns me completely 180 degrees, I turn into a small child and I lifted my legs up off my pedals and was like, what was that? What was that? What was that? And my buddy, Eric, <laughs> that we travel with a lot. Eric was like, that's an alligator. I think that was an alligator. And we look up and there's this giant weight going away from us. And I had basically like hit an alligator with my, with my pedal drive. Wow. And, and it was just like, what in the world? And I was just petrified for like, I don't know, 10 minutes, you know? And I was like, I was like, we're loading up. We're done. I'm not fishing anymore today. I'm done. And, um, we got back to the, to the boat ramp and I was kind of like, chill at that point you know we're kind of making jokes about it okay you know we're, we're safe we're good nothing happened the alligator's not following us and right. uh there was there was an older gentleman real og cajun with a giant flat bottom boat <laughs> with like a ladder rack on top with all these like cane poles like you would see on tv right it's like oh yeah. i bet this guy hunts hunts gators and we we sit there chatting with him and i was like man i was like are you hunting gators and he was like oh yeah i'm i'm after gators and uh, I said, man, I said, I got a great, I said, there's like a 10 or 12 foot alligator over here about half a mile away this way. Mm -hmm. And I was like, I just snuck up on him and, and hit him. And he goes, oh no, you don't sneak up on alligator. Alligator sneak up on you. And I, <laughs> they said, they looked at me and my face just turned completely white. And I was like, Ooh. <laughs> Ooh, I didn't think about that. I was like, you know, my thought was, man, I snuck up on an alligator and he got mad or hit the kayak or something. And that guy's like, oh, you don't sneak up on alligator. I'll go to sneak up on you. And I was like, you know what? That's not nearly as funny as it was three minutes ago after I realized I was safe. And then there was about another 10 minutes. And I was like, 
what just happened with that really and i was like you know what i don't, I don't even want to know so that was my first thought when i see you down on the on the paddleboard in, in florida and texas it's like uh, i would be petrified if i saw an alligator with my feet in the water <laughs> yeah i mean and also like the other thing is too like i'm not an idiot about it like of course like dude i'm not like i don't know there's different there's different scenarios where it's like of course i'm not gonna put my feet in like if i'm dude if i'm if I notice I'm two foot away from a gator, like I'm not just going to stick my toes in his mouth. You know what I mean? Like I have a little yeah. bit of, like a little bit of self-conscious about it, but um, there's one video that, that people were really upset about. It was, it was me hooking a, a like a big snook, it, not a monster snook, but like a 35 incher. And um, dude, this snook literally was taking me in circles. Like it just was fighting, 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 jumping all over the place, trying to run in the mangroves. And um, people were just like, you know, they were all upset that I had my feet in the water. And I was just looking at the video like, dude, if I didn't try to control this fish at all, it would have just slammed me into the mangroves. Archie would have fell in the water. All my stuff would have been everywhere. Like, dude, I've been drugging through mangrove, hitting me in the face. I'm like, dude, like, what do you want me to do? You know what I mean? Like, I, I'm going to stick my feet in and paddle a little bit, you know? And yeah. like I said, I'm always dangling in the water. I don't paddle with my feet in the water because there's too much drag. You know what I mean? Right, so I think... Right. I think that people think I'm like actively looking for it when I have like, you know, uh, of course I, I take a little bit of caution. It's not just like throwing my feet away, you know what I mean? But yeah. for the most part, I, I don't know that story you told me, I feel like, I feel like you did hit him and I feel like he ran away. That's my, that would be my thought on it. I don't know. Like I've, I heard a story, like somebody commented and said that an alligator like grabbed their, their pedal drive. And I'm like, dude, I want, I don't know. I want to see proof of that. You know what I mean? Like people say stuff I, like that. I but wish also, I had half the videos of stuff that has happened. And that that's the cause of this podcast to start with. You know what yeah, I mean? Dude, but probably would have cleared that up completely. Like you, if you had a GoPro up here, like I did, dude, you would have saw like, Oh dude, I ran over him and he took off or like, Oh, he charged me like either way, you know? Yeah. Uh, I just don't think, I don't think the way alligators work, they're ambush predators. They're kind of like large mouth. You know what I mean? They're not going to go out of their way to attack you like a, like a wahoo would attack something in open water or tuna. You know what I mean? Yeah. They're just not like that. They are ambush predators. And if they see you, they're like, dude, this thing is gigantic. Like, I don't want anything to do with that. I'm leaving. You know what I mean? Like yeah. they're, they're definitely more scared of you than they are, than you are of them. Um, and a lot of times it's, I kind of take it back to, to like people who say that like cotton mouths chase you or like snakes will chase them out of the water. I'm like, dude, that doesn't happen. That's literally just like, I mean, it might, a snake might swim towards you, but a snake is never, ever, ever going to chase you. Like that's just not in their brain. You know what I mean? They know they yeah. look at you unless it's a, unless it's a 20 foot reticulated Python, <laughs> like it's not going to chase you. You know what I mean? It has to be something <laughs> yeah. that is going to size you up and go, okay, I'm going to chase this. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. We, we were at uh Caddo, um, like kind of like uh, Shreveport. I don't. I don't know if I was on Caddo or one of the smaller lakes around Shreveport, but one one of the closest I ever got to having a snake in the kayak. It like started swimming towards me, and I was I was telling guys when I got off the water, you know how it goes. Fishing stories like, man, this right. this snake chased me, and I was all worried, you know. And one of the local guys was like, man, he was probably just trying to get out of the water, and he thought you were a giant log or something, you know. And I was like, I was like, I was booking it. I don't like snakes, you know. I was getting away from that thing. No, I do get that. Like, obviously, you don't want a snake in your kayak, but I promise you, the snake is not going to like actively try and attack you, like come at you and chase you. It just, it just doesn't happen. You know what I mean? Like, that's like, that's just not. They're not wired that way. You know? Yeah. Um, I don't know. That's just the way I think about it. And like I said, there's always like a level of caution I'm taking. Mm -hmm. um, but for the most part, whatever. If I, if I, if that's what it takes. That's what it takes. <laughs> any any close calls with any strange animals out and about? Um, not really. I mean, like I I've been like, like I said, I always, I always pick them up. Like that's my biggest thing. So I'm gonna go pick them up as long as it's not venomous. Like I'm like, all right. So I've been yeah. bit by a few. That's just me grabbing them. You know what I mean? Nothing crazy. Um, but no, not really. I've never been charged by a gator. I've never had a, an issue with with really anything out there. Honestly, um, I don't know. I'm trying to think, but I really. I really haven't, which I don't know if that's just like, I honestly think part of it is like my demeanor about it is because I feel like most of those critters can kind of sense when you're freaking out and I'm just like never freaking out. I'm just like, whatever, I'm here. I'm a part of like, I feel, I feel like I am a part of this ecosystem. You know what I mean? I'm quiet. I stay out of the way. 
I'm not trying to get anybody's thing. I'm not freaking out. I think they can tell when you're freaked out. You know, it's just like a dog. Like a dog can tell when you're upset. Like they know. They just know. Yeah. It's almost. It's almost like. It's almost like a sci-fi movie. Like how they know. Like how do you know? You're a dog. You know what I mean? <laughs> but I think yeah. the same for every other critter. I think. I think the fact that I'm just not really worried about it. I think that's why they don't. They don't come after me. <laughs> you know. Yeah. So uh, we'll, we'll switch gears a little bit. What's your um? like your, your favorite body of water that you've ran across that you, you don't care to talk about, like somewhere that's, um, you know, you're, you're comfortable talking about, you can even talk about, you know, somewhere that's private or whatever that you may not want to mention the name of, but what's like some favorite body of water that you've come across? One of my, one of my favorite bodies of water on this entire planet earth is, uh, is Lady Bird Lake in downtown Austin. Uh, I know you guys see me fish there all the time. And, uh, one of my, one of my favorite things about that lake is that there are no secrets. It is a lake that is absolutely just blown wide open. If there is a stick on the bottom in 25 foot of water, everybody knows about it. And I really like that because it challenges me to fish differently and, and figure out creative solutions to catch fish. And um, like a lot of people ask me like, you know, like how do you catch fish out there? And I'm like, man, I could tell you what I do, but it's probably not gonna work for you because I'm doing it. Like, like yeah. you gotta come own thing you got to make up your own style to go out there and fish um and that's kind of your home base ain't it like that's kind of your home base when you're that's, most of the year it's just easy to drop in it's really nice to fish there's a lot of homies out there you know what i mean it's fun to go out on the town lake it's kind of it's kind of like a vibe i don't know if you if you've ever been like if you've ever been pier fishing and you like meet the pier rats and they're just like always down there and like the fishing's yeah. not like, amazing but they're just always there because it's like what else am I going to do? You know what I mean? That's why I feel like town lake is you just pull up, drop in. Maybe your buddies are out there. You're probably going to, you know, you just see some hot chicks over there on the shore, hang out, catch a few bass. Maybe you get to watch the bats come out from the Congress bridge. It's a great time all around. You know, that is just a be- whole vibe downtown no. at Austin fishing. Yeah, no, the whole thing is nice. And then also there are some big fish in there and you could, you have the chance, you know what I mean? To always run into one. Um, it's one, it's one place that I know I can drop in. And any given day, I'm going to present to a fish that is over 10 pounds. Like, I know they're there. I've seen them before. They're not going to bite. Probably like 99.999% <laughs> of the time, they never bite. But at least I know, like, hey, I'm, I'm putting it in front of one, and I'm trying it out. You know what I mean? Um, yeah. It's a good, good feeling. I actually did finally catch a double digit out of that lake last year in July. Um, and that just was like, I've been looking for that one for a minute. Because I know... A town lake DD is so much different from a lot of other a lot of other places. There's not many people you're gonna meet that have a ladybird DD, especially not on film. Like there's just not that many. You know what I mean? There's some old ones from way back in the day, but especially yeah. like a day a modern day ladybird ten, that's very rare. It's very rare to come by. Was, was I, that I, the flea shad fish? No, no, that was uh, it was on the Bellows Gill. Uh, I was actually gotcha. punching, I was punching for that one. Um, the flea, I think that flea, that flea shad fish was on Lake Austin. It only went like nine, it was like nine and a half or something. Um, gotcha. well, but <laughs> yeah, no, that, that one came on a bellows gill, uh, 5.8, just straight braid punch in the mat. Um, it was a spot that I knew like had big fish on it. And I'd seen, I have seen teener class fish in that spot before. And like I said, it's just, it was one of those days I showed up, lined up the moon phase, pulled up. I was quiet everything else around me was just right. And it just happened. Like it was just one of those magical days, you know what I mean? Where you do everything one, one of those days where you can feel it when you get out there, you kind of know something might happen that day. hundred percent. I, I, I remember I tied on the punch rig and I was just like, man, like I, I remember looking through my box that morning. Right. And I was like, if any bait in here is going to catch me a 10 pounder within the next six months, it's going to be this Bellows Gill. Like I'm just, I just know it. I literally went out and stuck a 10 on that day. I was like, dude, that, that, what is that? Like <laughs> the universe telling me, you know what I mean? Like, Oh, there you go. You got it. <laughs> I love, I love that bait. That's probably, that's one of my favorite baits of all time. It's a, it's a very good, very good big fish catcher. I'm going to have to stop throwing it now though, because everybody else throws it at town like now and now the bite's blown out, <laughs> but that's how it goes. That's how it goes out there. It's always, it's always, it's always cycling. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah, and trying to stay ahead of the curve of new stuff that comes out and, and all exactly. that. Exactly. That's fun for me, though. I really enjoy that. Like, to me, you know what I mean? There's, like, levels to catching a big fish, like I was talking about earlier, like landing a trick. You know what I mean? There's a there's a difference between, like, a, a teener or even a double digit, right? A double digit, just because two people caught a double digit doesn't mean it's the same fish. 
Like if you go out on OHIV with a guide and you live scope a 10 pounder, or if you bed fish a 10 pounder, it's got like an asterisk next to it. You know what I mean? But if you go out on town lake and you drop in with your paddle board and you punch a 10 pounder, no graphs, no nothing, they don't weigh the same. You know what I mean? Like they don't weigh yeah. the same. It's just not the same fish. Like it, it took a lot, like one is a lot harder than the other and a lot more rare to come by. Um, yeah. 10 out of, a 10 out of Ivy doesn't, doesn't really mean anything. You know what I mean? Like it's not, right, it's still, yeah. Like it's there's cool there's guys like, with catching limits of 10 on, on Ivy yeah, like exactly. a year or two ago. Yeah. The the cool thing about trophy bass is that it is rare, that it does not happen very often. If I went out every day and caught a 10, it wouldn't be cool. If I went out and every day and I caught a 10, I would be very upset that I'm not catching 13s. That's how it would be. It would, <laughs> what is the next? Like, come on, it's got to be the next. And that's, that's how it'll go. You know what I mean? Like I'm always hunting for the next 10 and eventually I'll be like, man, when is this teener going to come along? And then teener, man, when is this 15 pounder? You know what I mean? Like it, it, yeah, it's with always, the world record coming. Yeah. Right? It's always searching for that rarer moment. And I, like I said, the world record to me is like the, the pinnacle of a rare moment because think about how many people are on this planet earth, 8 billion people. Right. And one of them has the world record. That is a wild statistic to me. And like, to be that guy, like Manabu, the fact that he has it is just like, dude, that's hard. Like that's hard. That goes yeah. hard. And when I see him just post, I'm like, man, like, where do you go from there? You know, that's it. Like you're the man, <laughs> you know, yeah, it's and, and like, what... go ahead. Part of me would be like, if I caught a world record, it'd be like, okay, um, what, what am I supposed to do now? Like I, I've, I've peaked in a fishing aspect. What, what am I supposed to do now? You know what I mean? Right. No, I, I think if I do catch the world record, it won't be like I'm done. It'll be like, well, I could break this one. Like, there's always like a look. You could always have this same fish and it could have an extra bluegill in its belly. Like, where is the, like, it could keep going a little further. You know, yeah. I, I read, I read a lot of stories about out there in Japan. And um, for those who don't know, I've done a bunch of reading on Manabu, um, the current world record holder, but he actually had the previous Japan world record as well. So there's like some controversy. I'm sure you guys know that the, it was caught on a live bluegill, the 22.5. And some people are like, oh, this dude just like live baited it, whatever. Um, I'm here to like, I'm going to cover, I'm going to, I'm going to cover for him. He's actually like an original gangster, right? So he had the previous Japan record at 18 pounds and he caught it on the Roman made mother, which is like, just that to me is like, okay, he's legit. He's catching these fish like often. Like this is not just a one-off fluke, right? He yeah. literally, there's a Bassmaster article that they released a long time ago. Like this was, I read this when I was in high school, but um, it was an interview with him and it basically said, he said that he had caught the 18 pounder and he had knew the world record was in Biwa. And he just said that I was going to go catch it on a live bluegill to prove it was in here. That's all I'm doing is I'm going to catch this fish, prove it's in here. And there's a bigger one. He even has like a, there's like a little blurb in there where he says, he says that he lost one on the Roman made mother that he thinks was in the 28 pound range. Now, like, wow, whatever you think about that, right? Wow. Like you might He's just talking, you know, he's just talking out his ass. If anyone knows what a 28 pounder would look like, it would be him. That's all it's, I'm it's saying. The dude right? that's got two over 18. Yeah. That's, that's the guy that gets credit. If, if, <laughs> that's all e even, even if it's not a 28, somebody that's caught an 18 and a 22, if, if they estimate it, you know, get big eyed on it, it still is probably a what 24, 25, right. you know, that's what I'm saying. You know what I mean? Like even if you low ball the 28, like it's still the world record, like another yeah. world record. So that's where I, 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 I really respect him a lot. Cause then I think, like I said, people throw shade at him because he caught it on live bluegill, but he literally said, I, ju I just wanted to prove it. Like that is all there was no, there was nothing else. Like he just wanted to catch it, prove it was in there and then keep searching. Like that's his big thing. So I was like, respect, you know, that's big. That's respect right there. You know, <laughs> any, any plans possibility to go to, to go to buy to maybe try to go throw the paddleboard out there, you know, go, go fly with your, with your paddleboard and go out there to try to fish. <laughs> hundred percent. I, I'm actually like, I am pretty heavily considering just moving out there. Um, there's a lot like, like the housing is pretty cheap there. Living there is pretty cheap. If you're coming from America. Um, I think that, I think that the world record over there is catchable. Um, I I've talked to this with, I talked to Jeffrey about this, Jeffrey, the King, and he's pretty big on that too. I think he's going to be moving over there. He's like serious about it within the next two years. Um, I might take a little longer cause I want to explore the U S a little more, but what we were talking about is like a world record existing in the U S 
And I think there is, I think there are world records in the U S there might be one in Rodman reservoir. There might be one in Dixon, but I don't think they're catchable. Like I just don't, I don't think they're catchable, but the ones in Japan, I think Biwa is so big and so massive and everything is set up just right. The bait, everything that I think it's catchable. Like, I think that it doesn't get enough pressure, you know what I mean? To where it's just completely locked jaw. So definitely like here in the next like five years, you'll probably just see me over there full time. Like, I'll, I don't know. Maybe, maybe if I really make it rich and famous, I'll just buy a house over there or something so I can just fly back and forth and stay. Um, but that's that. That's the end goal, man. I want to get really good. And then I want to go over there and chase the world record. That's it. There's nothing else for me. You know, <laughs> that's awesome. Is there is there anywhere that you've uh, got like a stateside that is like a bucket list fishery for you that you maybe haven't gotten to that is is you know world record quality fishery that you haven't been to? Um, man, honestly, not like not really. I've kind of been to all the. I mean, of course, I fished Fork, I fished Dixon. There's a couple lakes out in California that I really want to go fish, um, like Diamond Valley and Poway, and all those lakes that are pretty pretty famous um but it's just so expensive to go out to california it's like it doesn't make sense because i can literally drive out here to florida and stay in florida for two months for maybe a quarter of the price than it would take me to go out there to cali and stay for two months like it's crazy so i'm just like like for now i'll leave that but definitely there's some cali some cali reservoirs that i'd like to go to but other than that like i said i've seen uh, i'm going to orange lake tomorrow i've seen lake fork you know what i mean lake austin uh i've been to ivy once like all this stuff um you know, I, I, other than that, other than going to Japan, I really don't have any big plans, um, except just to kind of fish around and, uh, meet new people and try and just try and hone my skills. You know what I mean? Like, I just want to keep getting better. Like you gotta like raise the ceiling really high, you know, if you want to shoot for something like that. So I, yeah. I always, there's always, there's always ways to improve there. Any, uh, any like smallmouth trips that you, you do or have planned or anything like that? Does that kind of get you going? This, uh, this summer, I'll be going up to Minnesota again. I usually go up there and fish the Mississippi River. Amazing smallmouth fishing. Like, it is ridiculous. You can catch them on swimming. How, how far up through there do you go? Um, so, I mean, like, I've been really far up north with Kyle before where we go, like, um, oh, I can't even think of the town. But, like, I mean, like, way, way up there, like, really close to the border. Um, gotcha. But usually I just stay kind of, like, right outside of Minneapolis. There's some good spots in there. But there's spots that are literally in walking distance from Kyle's house. So it's nice. I just like walk down to the river and I can catch a six pounds Molly. And that's super awesome. Like super fun. I like I've got to venture further up the Mississippi river. Cause I've been to lacrosse for tournaments and I, I, I am not a fan of the la, la, lacrosse area. It gets beat to death and I'm just not a fan <laughs> of it. But people keep telling me I need to go further up that river and, and I would have a lot more fun. Dude, upper Minnesota is like, it, it feels like you're fishing untouched water because those fish are just dumb. Like the smallmouth and even most fish up north i'm sorry they just are not as hard to catch as the ones down south <laughs> like dude, well they really up. don't get casted at for no. four or five months out of the year no no yeah they're just they're just down there and they're chilling and and they they feed up in the summertime like crazy like you can go you can go up to minnesota and catch four or five pounds smallies and largies like pretty much all summer long um I'm not saying like a five pounder is like super easy to come across but all you gotta do is hop on google earth and find a lake that not many people are fishing and go fish it. You know, if it's yeah. got any water in the right bait, like it'll probably have a good, a good five pounder in it. Um, trying to get me a Minnesota six pounder. That's kind of like the goal, I guess. Every time I go up there, I'm always looking, I have a, I have a five eleven right now, which is pretty good, but um, I don't know. You saw, I'm sure you saw a Phoenix, uh, Phoenix Pickner. He caught a, a six fourteen on the battle shot up there, which was really cool. Uh, that was, that's a giant. Old, uh, yeah. So it's like two pounds off the state record, which is nuts. Like you're like yeah. right in, it is a monster for Minnesota. Um, no, I, lo- I love it up there. It is, it is a very fun fishery. Um, I always get homesick for Texas, though. <laughs> <laughs> so I can't stay up there very long. So is your, is your road tripping back from Florida to Texas, you going to make like a long drive back, or you just kind of fish your way back day to day? I, I thought about it, but honestly, there's not really much I want to stop for. Like coming into like March and April is like, prime time like this is the time where i really believe that i have a shot at like a big fish um so i'm just kind of like ready to get back and fish the home waters that i know florida was like a good reset because like dude december and january and even like most of february in texas is just rough like it just sucks yeah. especially off paddleboard not fun um, so i was <laughs> like you know what i'm gonna go reset i'm gonna go down to florida catch a bunch of fun stuff and then come back and i have like a 
I have a new mindset on now. Like it like cleared me. I caught, like I said, I got to try out some new techniques and stuff like that. And, uh, I get to come back and have a new lens on the stuff that I've already fished. So I'm actually, I'm actually really excited to get back. So I'm probably just gonna, I'm going to book it. <laughs> so ro road tripping back. Are you, are you a podcast guy? Or are you a music guy? What's your, what's your go-to music I, playlist or go-to podcast? I try not to listen to music while I'm driving, at least like long drives, honestly, because I like to listen to music in the gym more often or like, you know what I mean? I like to go to the concerts and like really enjoy myself there. But I don't know. I feel like when I listen, I always, I just have like my little niche taste in music and I like to listen to my stuff. And, and if I listen to it too much, then I stop liking it. So I try and yeah. I definitely, I definitely stick to the podcast. Obviously, you know, I'm good friends with Adrian scales and tails, my homeboy, good podcast. He's always dropping episodes every week. So every time I, it's like two months, then boom, I have like loaded up. I have like 20 hours worth of podcasts to listen to. And then honestly, like, a lot of just like, now I'm not watching YouTube while I'm driving, but I'll just put on like YouTube, like, like, uh, some of the channels that I like to listen to, like commentary, video essay, stuff like that. And just kind of listen, listen to, a uh, <laughs> listen to a history video about, you know, whatever, whatever <laughs> weird topic that comes up. I just kind of let it autoplay. Let's my mind run wild. You know, while I'm driving. <laughs> what's, what's your, what's your musical niche? Uh, I really like, so, uh, I don't know. It's kind of weird. I like, I really like a lot of heavy metal, like uh, extreme technical death metal is probably one of my favorite bands, like or uh, genres. Uh, Arc Spire, First Fragment, big fan of First Fragment. I'm actually First Fragment's number one fan. Um, <laughs> <laughs> every time I go to Austin, I'm there. I, I, I'm there. I buy all the merch. Uh, that's my. That's probably my favorite band. And then, uh, dude, I don't know if you ever heard. Have you ever heard of Alestorm? <laughs> I, I haven't. That's uh, heavy metal is not not my strong suit. <laughs> Yeah, no, it, a Alestorm is like a, uh, it's like a pirate metal band. It's like a really dope band out of Scot or out of Scotland. And they just like, I don't know, dude, they just throw down. Like me and, me and Juan used, to, we went to the Alestorm concert uh, earlier. When was this? I'm trying to think of when it was. It was like maybe August. It was like in the middle of summer last year, but we went to the Alestorm concert. It was me and him and my little brother. And we just like, I don't know what it was. We just all knew the words and we were just having a good time, like dancing around. It's just, this, it's just, it was just fun. You know what I mean? There, there's um, nothing better than going to a concert where you're like, it's a band that you're a super big fan of. That's not like a, a, a super popular band. That's kind of flooded, um, you know, social yeah. media. Like everyone that's at the concert knows the words and is hanging out. And I, you just are surrounded love, by people that you can be friends <laughs> with without even knowing them. Dude. I love that stuff so much. That is like, I, I don't go to too many concerts, but I make sure I pick them right. Like I go to the ones that are like bangers, dude. I like I said, first fragment isn't like a super big band or anything, but uh, when you show up and everybody's a first fragment fan, like we all got the shirts on. There's only like 30 people like in the in the pit. You know what I mean? It's like it's just it's sick. Like it's such a sick vibe. I actually went to, I had my best concert experience ever, pro probably ever. Like almost number one. I don't know. It's hard to pick, but. Um, me and my buddy, Brian, so nine pound hammer on Instagram. He's a big, uh, hardcore guy and I'm not, I'm not really in the hardcore scene, but, um, he got me into this band called power trip and, uh, basically power trip disbanded, right? Because their lead singer died. It was like this big deal. Everybody's all sad. So I was listening to power trip. I was like, damn, dude, this is sick. And then, uh, basically, um, there was this other band called fugitive, right? And, uh, the singer for fugitive was like, okay, we're going to, we're going to, I'm going to sing for power trip and it was going to be like this surprise concert. Right. So we all went, but Brian knows the guys. So he like knew it was going to happen. So we go to this concert. Nobody knows power trip is going to be there first time in like four years. <laughs> and this, when I tell you electric, I mean, electric dude, there's, it's literally the, the Mo it's called Mohawk, the, the place in Austin. There's yeah. a second story and people were doing front flips off the second story balcony into the crowd and like i mean it was ridiculous dude like i don't know i don't know if you know anything about hardcore but like it is wild it is just i, I, I could imagine <laughs> <laughs> it's not for everybody because it's like a lot of swinging and just kicking and like throwing karate and like all this crazy stuff like it's like it moshing y'all mosh pitting oh Oh yeah. This is like another level though, dude. This is like, this is like scary moshing. This is like, yeah, y'all borderline fighting, hanging out. <laughs> Almost. I, 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 one moment I was sitting there and I, I was just like, the crowd is like all over. So I'm just like grabbing people's shoulders and we're like head banging. And there was like this, there was like this really short chick that turned around and she just punched me in the stomach. And I was just like, yeah, 
let's go. <laughs> I just remember like, I don't know why it stuck out to me, but we were just like, I don't know. It's just like in the moment, I can't even describe it. And so you're just there and it sounds ridiculous. It sounds crazy, but dude, I love, I love that stuff. It's just something I don't get to do very often. And when I get to go, I just go crazy. Like I go crazy. So if anybody's listening and wants to go to hardcore concerts with me, let me know. <laughs> I, I'm sure somebody's going to reach out. That's that's going to be that's going to be down I'm for in. that because I'm, in. I, I'm I, not a hardcore fan, but that's like I, I could kind of feel the excitement of you explaining yeah. it. You know, dude, it's fun. I can't I can't describe it. It's like you're. It's just primal. It's like really primal because you're like, you, like it's one of those things where you're just not thinking about anything else. You're just there. You're 100 <laughs> percent there. You know, and like I, I look for those moments in life. Where you're just all there and there's nothing else going on. I love that stuff, dude. Love it. That's awesome. That's <laughs> awesome. Anyway, so tangent, hardcore tangent. <laughs> <laughs> so if 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 you're traveling back, I know um for anybody that watches your stuff, you're a big noodle guy. Noodle. Like uh yeah, like noodle, like like you eat eating noodles, like almost like a fancy ramen, like the Korean style kind of noodle noodle things. <laughs> Is, is that your go-to snack? You're not like a trail mix or beef jerky guy. You're a noodle guy, ain't you? So I've actually been like uh, the last like two months while I've been down here, I've been not on like a, not on a diet, but I've been just trying to eat like good, healthy fuel. So I, I try and keep the noodles to a limited, but I do, I do like my fancy ramen. I love going to like ramen places or getting sushi or whatever like that. That's like my little special treat or hibachi. I just went to hibachi with Zeth. That was really nice. Um, yeah, I'm a big fan of that. Anything that's high sodium, I'm in, dude. Call, count me in. I'm here for it. Just going to the store, like when you go into like the Asian market, and they just have the whole aisle full of noodles, and you just like it's all in in Japanese or whatever, and you can't read it, and you're just like, all right, try this, and it's just so it's it's like fun because you're just like, I have no idea what this is gonna be, and you try it, maybe it's good, maybe it's bad, and then you find a couple, and you get to show them to your friends. You know, dude, try this out. This is really good. I like that stuff. It's, it's pretty. You fun. like a big spicy noodle guy? I know in some of those, like they have like the different <laughs> logos of how many flames it is on how hot it is. You big spicy I'm, noodle guy? I'm definitely on the lower side. I like more mild stuff for sure. I I like um I don't know I I I enjoy like a tasteful amount of spice, but I yeah. don't want it to burn my tongue off. You know what I mean? Like I love salsa. I love stuff like that, but it can't be too hot. Um, I guess I am. I am white after all. <laughs> <laughs> so you're staying, you're staying away from the five flame ones. Oh yeah. Uh, uh not for me. Not for me. <laughs> so, um, we're, we're getting close to an hour. You, you want to, uh, thank any of your like, uh, sponsors or anybody that's kind of keeping you going out on the road. Yeah. Um, sure. Dude. Throwback, uh, Kyle from throwback is my number one man. I mean, we're best friends. Do we call every day? Um, just, just so you guys know the kind of relationship here. Um, back when I, back when I really, really was homeless and like living out of my truck, uh, Kyle kind of took me in for a month and like, just kind of showed me how to make baits and we fished and stuff like that. And, uh, it was, it was dope. It was a really dope experience. We just connected. And ever since then, dude, we've been like, we've been on it. And, uh, the only kind of goal is just to like help build each other up. You know what I mean? Like, so all the throwback products that you see, like, like this glide that is, uh, very soon to be released. These are all, these all have my touch. I, I promise you that all these baits are baits that I believe in. I, and I have a part in making them. Like Kyle sends me the prototype, I fish it and I'm brutally honest with him. If I don't like it, I'm like, Hey dude, this is terrible. This is not good. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, he'll tell yeah. you first, like, dude, I, martial hurts my feelings, but I really appreciate it. Cause I need somebody to tell me that. <laughs> so like, dude, the stuff like the glide took, I mean, we are, this is like version like 15 or something, you know what I mean? But, um, that's, that's what I, that, you know, I take pride in like being a part of that company because it's a really good company handmade here in the USA. You know what I mean? It's, it's, it's real stuff. He's got a family to feed at home and he's just, he grinds, dude. He knows how to run a business. He knows how to get a product out there, how to make a good looking logo and stuff like that. Um, Kyle's my number one man. And then, uh, Leviathan rods are my main rods. Thank you, Eric. You're the man. And then, uh, G crack. G crack lures for all the soft baits. That's the good stuff right there. Can't beat that. You, you've, you've got it covered. Uh, shout out Kyle too. I, I've got a, a, a short Kyle story. He, uh, for, for Christmas, he did a giveaway of 10 baits for, for kids. Right. Oh yeah. And, uh, yeah. they were, they were purple, uh, purple shad flea shads. Mm -hmm. 
And uh, one of the young kids that me and my buddy Eric, uh, one of his uh, friend's son, Brody, shout out Brody. I know you're watching. I talked to you today about he's a young kid, can't drive, loves big swim baits. He was asking me about swim bait reels today. And uh, he got one of those uh, giveaway flea shads. So um, I, I know firsthand how, how awesome and how, um, how, how cool Kyle is with, with giving back to the community. Um, he's a, sh he's shout out Kyle. I've, I've got to get a throwback. I've got a whole box full of, of swim baits. I got one of those giant, um, you know, like $200 crates that, that, um, I can't even think of the name of it, but it's like the vertical to put, put your baits in yeah. that nothing, nothing tangles or anything. Um, yeah. I, I got, I got to get a throwback to put in there. I got, I got to get me a flea shad or, uh, you know, I, I really like his, uh, what do they call them? The, the wood ones. Which one? The bunny, the chickadee. There's a couple of different ones. I guess I guess it's just the the woody versions of like a flea shad or like his his the the say? wood the woody is discontinued now the uh, the 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 baby woody that is the last we did the last oh run. I missed it I yeah, missed we it last, we did the last run last Saturday we replaced them with the cheat codes which is a resin version um, the the woodies were just I mean they're too expensive they're too hard to make and they're a little inconsistent like not every product is the same which I like personally I love yeah, I my do too. I love my wood baits because you buy one and it might not be a banger, but then you buy one and it's a really good bait. Like I, yeah. I like variety cause I know that like, Hey, no one else has this exact bait that I have, but yeah. for, you know, for most people, like I said, we can run the cheat codes at 99 bucks, which is our cheapest bait at the moment, which is really cool. So it gets them in more people's hands. And I like the cheat code a lot. I like the cheat yeah. code, and the Contra shad, which is probably one of my new favorite throwback lures for sure. Um, they're, they're, they're good stuff, but yeah, miss the woody. But there's still uh, we still have the chickadees and the bunnies. Those are both wood, um, and those are both great baits too. So gotcha. I, I'm a big fan of wood bait stuff. You know, growing up in East Tennessee and hearing all the uh, you know old, old timers talk about old wood baits, your big O's and your wooden crank baits and stuff. I've got yeah. a whole pile of you know different kind of wooden baits that I I loved cranking. You know, when I kind of got into fishing and have got a Rapala collection of of okay. discontinued wood baits, and uh, I, I I'm definitely gonna have to track down a woody i'm gonna be in somebody on swim bait universe's <laughs> dms probably tonight i hope i hope the the price hasn't jumped too high yet but <laughs> but uh yeah no definitely definitely there's some out there and uh i'm actually i'm actually another plug for the the patreon i'm actually giving away i don't know if this will come out before the end of february but i'm actually giving away the woody and cheat code pink lemonade bundle on the patreon for all the ten dollar members um so I'm, that'll be you'll be entered in a giveaway for that so that's the last i think that's the last woody that is officially going out right there um uh, so be, one of be my, right back i'm about to go sign up for that and just one of my lucky one of, if, I, if i'm not paying attention here for a second i'm signing <laughs> up for something <laughs> one of my lucky patrons is gonna win that that bundle they'll get both of them which is really cool um and that's the color that i designed so old pink lemonade it'll be just like this but the woody and the cheat code which is sick so what's, what's yeah. your favorite watercolor to throw the pink lemonade in since that's your <laughs> your Dude, I, uh marshall arn wine pink lemonade color what's your favorite watercolor for that really really any watercolor it's really surprised me it's definitely more of a muddy watercolor but dude i have a day i went out just the other day and i caught this was the first day throwing this brand new retro glide in the pink lemonade i caught two sixes and a five pounder in like really clear water like four foot visibility they were just smoking it i was like dang i didn't think it was gonna work i took it up i was like oh i'm gonna test cast it you know this is too bright to be and they, they were just crushing it so i was like all right i don't think i don't think it really matters to be honest i think it could be any i think it'd be any visibility um i've caught some i caught some pink lemonade fish in some really clear water like down there on the nuasis river and stuff like that where it's just like crystal crystal clear to the bottom mm. um i don't think color matters too much i've never been a big color guy you know just, yeah there's definitely a niche of people that really like especially if you go up north those super clear fisheries up north that people love throwing the brightest ugliest colors for smallmouth and dude and it, ultra clear water you'd be surprised at the advantages of just throwing a completely different bait has like if you're you know like i said maybe maybe a natural one is going to get you more bites like a green pumpkin you might get you know more bites overall but if you go out there and throw something wild maybe you'll catch a 10, maybe you'll catch a big fish. You know what I mean? Like who knows? Yeah. Cause it, I think a lot of those bigger fish in the lake, they, they're not, they don't set up right. Like once a bass gets past about four pounds, it kind of becomes its own person. You know what I mean? It's got its own personality. Yeah. 
gone through different traumas. Maybe it's been caught shallow a, a bunch, you know, the whole time it's been caught on a jig like four times. And he's like, all right, I'm not ever <laughs> caught at again. You know, they, they're all different. So you go out to target a trophy fish and it's not like you're going to pattern trophy fish. You're going out to fish for one fish that is going to fall for your fishing style. That's why I'm always trying to change and keep an open mind and try different stuff. And that's why I'll never, ever be like, you know, oh, this is pink and yellow probably not going to get mid clear water you don't know like you literally have no idea like nobody knows that's the really fun thing about fishing is that you always get that like "Ah, maybe not today but but maybe hey maybe it might happen you know like i love that feeling you just go out as long as you keep that maybe in your mind good things can happen (laughs) that's what i love about it i've never really heard anybody you know kind of uh, explain it in that manner of you know targeting big fish that have their own personality because I'm personally a really big pattern guy because I fish tournaments and I grew up fishing tournaments. So it's always pattern, pattern, pattern. But, you know, to, to look at it with that nature of, man, I, I need to go throw some off the wall stuff and try to target one fish. That's, that's a completely different ball game of, of thought process that somebody can go down and it opens up kind of a, a new um, area to explore mm-hmm. kind of mentally as you approach a fishery. It, dude, it's all mental. It's a hundred percent mental. Like it is like, the, the lake is your canvas and your rod is your paintbrush and you just do whatever you want. You know what I mean? Whether it's like, whether it's long lining or trolling or, you know, trying some weird, just junk, whatever, you know what I mean? It doesn't matter. Like whatever you're doing, you always have a chance, you know, to catch that big fish. And maybe it's the next thing. I think that there's too many people out there fishing that hinder themselves because they kind of get to a certain level. They're like, okay, I can cast pretty good. I know what they're going to bite. I'm just going to go out and run these patterns and that's it. Like when it's cloudy, they, you have to throw a spinner bait. When it's sunny, you got to drag a drop shot. I just don't believe in any of that. You know what I mean? Cause each fish is its own individual thing. And it is different for the tournament scene. It's definitely better to go pattern fish in a tournament. And, um, I, I think that my approach is definitely less effective when it comes to day by day. But I think when it becomes to big fish, I think I have a more effective approach just because like I said, being more open-minded to different techniques. Like you said, you keep your, you keep your ceiling high and make sure, you know, like I always tell myself, I'm like, there's always something else I can learn. Like I, there is always something else. It doesn't matter what it is, man. I've, I have, I have drug a Nico rig and a shaky head and all kinds of little worms for more hours than I have. Like, I don't even know more hours than I've slept in my entire life. Right. <laughs> and I still don't know everything there is to know about worm fishing. I got to keep that in my head. Like, I feel like I'm a really good worm fisherman, but I still don't know everything. You know what I mean? Like always keep that open. You know what I mean? Cause if, you, as soon as you close it off, as soon as you're like, all right, I'm as good as I can get, it's gone. All that other progress is gone right there and you'll never improve. You know what I mean? Like I said, mental game, totally mental game. <laughs> this is uh, you have, so, go, ahead. go ahead. No, no, no ahead. You're, you're good. Go ahead. You're good. Go ahead. I was going to, I was going to completely switch topic to something else, but go, um, go, go right ahead. I was going to ask you if you wanted to mention anything else, go, go right ahead. So this, uh, this kind of does fall in line with your podcast. I didn't want to, I didn't want to come on here and completely just talk about random whatever, uh, for the whole time, but there's actually a Bassmaster kayak open, uh, in April, I believe on a lake that I really like. I'm not going to say it here. Um, uh, cause I try and keep everything. I try and keep most of that stuff on the low Possum on kingdom. A, on a lake that I think I could win, right? This is a lake that I'm just like, I, I, you, I think- you, you're talking about possum king. I literally just got back from the Bassmaster opens. Like that's one of the series that I, that I fish. I just got back from Murray and, uh, and, and nearly drowned at Murray, but, uh, that's a different story for another day, but yeah, it's, it's possum kingdom. I mean, that's a, a an incredible fishery that a lot of people have, have circled on the, on their calendar. I think, I think I could win that tournament. I, I think I could win that tournament. I think I could go out there and I could do it on my paddleboard with no graphs, no nothing. And I could, I could take the Roman made mother and a Nico rig worm. And I could, I think I could win it. I, I really, that's the one tournament I've ever, and I, I looked at the, what is it? $250 for entry fee or 200. Yeah. G- um, give or take. Yeah. I'm considering it. So you guys might see. You, you should, if, if you sign up for yep. that, then I, I might try to figure out a way <laughs> to come down there because that, that was on, I wouldn't plan on fishing that it's like 16 hours from my house and I've got some other stuff to do the week before and the week after, but, um, I keep hearing incredible things about possum kingdom that it's like a big bait factory of, of catching fish. 
I'm not gonna say too much, but I, I you don't want to sign up for it because I'm gonna take first place. <laughs> Dude, so when I, I, when this drops, the place that it drops on KBN, pe- people are going to eat this up because they're, I mean, that's, that's an event that they'll be like on our first Bassmaster uh, kayak series open this, this past weekend, we had like 258 people sign up. So like, there's going to be a lot of people that are, that are going to listen to this and be like, Ooh, Ooh, and that's, I think, that's awesome. I think no one is going to be doing what I'm doing. I don't think a single person is going to be doing it. And I, I, I just, I just feel like, I mean, of course, a couple of things have to go right. This would be yeah. this me going out there and swinging and going for the win, not going out there to just place. Um, and this would be a one-time thing. I don't, I probably wouldn't fish anything after, else after this. It would just be a fun, <laughs> it'd be a fun thing to do. But if I have an extra two hundred dollars laying or laying around, I, I think I'm going to do it. It would, it would be a pretty funny experience because um, I've that never would, fished. That would be awesome. I've never fished like a real kayak tournament before. And uh, in the fine print, it does say you can fish it on an inflatable stand-up paddleboard. So I was like, Hey, yeah. I'm in, I'm in, you know? Um, <laughs> and I think it would, I think it would send a nice little shock wave through the community. Uh, if I was able to win with no graphs, no pedal drive, no nothing, just go out there, you know, me and Archie sticking it out and uh, catching some big fish. I think that you, would, I think you would definitely have a camera bow all over you for, for two days. If you showed up in a paddle board with a bearded dragon on the front of it and, <laughs> and, and dominated, that would be 100%. all over everything. hundred <laughs> percent. I think that would be, I think that would be it. I, I just want to, I like really one of my other kind of like missions when it comes to fishing is I want to like, I want to keep pushing this sport. You know what I mean? Like I don't want to keep being stuck in the old ways. Like I really think that, there's a lot of boundaries that haven't been broken yet. And I feel like one thing that's kind of like, I don't know, it's for me, I feel like it's not too much. Like, um, I'm trying to think of a way to put this. I'm not, I'm not dogging on anybody. If you go out there and you have fun doing what you're doing, keep doing it. Right. But I think that the way the tournament scene is now, not even just kayak fishing, just tournament scene in general, it's sort of a, at least, it feels like a pay to win. You know what I mean? You got to have a lot of money. You got to be able to buy a boat and all this graph, even to just compete. And I really would, I really wish that we could kind of step it back a little bit. Um, and kind of do like, kind of do some old school stuff, man. Like, I don't know, this is a pretty good video that you guys should go watch, but there's a, there's an old video on YouTube. It's called Japan's top bank fishing. Right. And it's a, it's a two or it's a one V one bank fishing tournament where they have two cameramen, that fall around. It's with Taku Idu. Taku Idu is in this. It's an old Taku Idu video. And, um, dude, they're following these guys around fishing from the bank. They're, you know, they're battling each other, um, driving around the city and fishing. And it's just, to me, like that video is so exciting and it gets me hyped because like he's out there fishing from the bank, doing stuff that anyone could do. You know what I mean? It really feels like I'm here with him. You know what I mean? Like, man, I walk down the bank and do that. I throw that stuff. You know, but when I when I watch a Bassmaster Classic or, or something like that, or even the the Bassmaster Kayak stuff, I'm like, dude, I, I just don't it don't I don't find it very relatable, and I don't think a lot of people relate to it. You know what I mean? And like I said, no bash in anybody. Like I said, if you get out yeah. there and have fun, want to do it, I I I you know I get along with most of these people. I'm not coming yeah. up to you and be like, hey, you're, you're doing this wrong. You know, <laughs> I just feel like there's be some room for a few changes, maybe just an additional series. Hey, what if we had a cool bank fishing? tournament series where you know what i mean we picked like urban lakes and then we had these cameramen like running around with the bank fishermen where they're like climbing trees to make casts and stuff like that that is just exciting to me and i feel like there's a whole little niche there that is not it's like untapped you know what i mean same yeah. thing paddleboard fishing kayak fishing with no graphs and stuff like that getting in the back stuff um i love that you know and that's what that's the st- that's the kind of stuff that gets clipped that people want like you see the video where uh I forgot who it was, but what's his name? Drove his boat over the little land thing. And uh, tried... Keith, Keith Boche. Yeah. And he jumped into the other thing. Dude, that's the kind of stuff people want to see. I don't know if they disqualified him for that, but th- that's cool. That's awesome. Like that's yeah. fun. You know? like, that's getting out there and that's like getting creative. You know, um, I think there's some, I think there's some room to expand. I think there's uh, I think there's more, you know, there's more room to grow. And I think that, I think that the Bassmaster and tournament side of things doesn't have to just be this like, elitist kind of thing where you got to pay all this money to get in i think that you know that's the reason there's a lot of youtubers that are popular you know because it's relatable like the stuff i do is pretty relatable like i I fish some expensive lures but for the most part people can buy what i buy 
you know, for like less than $500 and go out and do it themselves. You know, yeah. it's relatable content. And that's what I like watching too. I like seeing yeah. stuff like, hey, I can do that, you know? Yeah. One um, of our most popular kind of East Tennessee YouTubers is a guy by the name of John Dalton that does Creek Fishing Adventures. And he basically just goes around and, and bank fishes and kayak fishes and just random small creeks and stuff. And, mm -hmm. you know, he's catching bluegill on, you know, little ultralight rigs and and throws a bunch of uh, yum dingers and just kind of fishes like how most of us got into fishing. That kind of made us love it, you know, and he's a very popular YouTuber. I don't know what any of his numbers are off the top of my head, but he's he's a popular guy, you know. Yeah, that's, I think that's dude. I think that's there's a market for that. I think there's people that like that. I think a I think a Bassmasters bank fishing tournament series would be awesome. I would watch that. I don't know about you. That would be crazy. I, if that came out, if that title came out, I'd be like, huh? And I'd go click on it. I'd go watch it. You know what I mean? I'd be very interested. Yeah. I think that, dude, I think watching, I don't know, watching something very engaging like that, like, is, is fun. I think that's fun. I think that's very engaging. I think that's a way to push the sport um, and get more people into it. You know what I mean? Get more people. And it's, it's a cool vibe, you know? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. That's that's a that's a whole whole new realm right there. Bass Bassmaster bank fishing. That's untapped potential. I know. I need to I need to shoot him an email. <laughs> <laughs> that'd be that'd be fun though. You know. Man, that was uh, an an awesome last last little bit. Do you have anything else that you wanna wanna bring up or, or talk about or anything for before we hop off? I think I think that's it, man. I think I got everything off my chest. Um very nice to hop on this podcast and talk about some different stuff. I feel like I'm always running through the whole, you know, like most, most of the generic stuff, but I got to talk about some fun stuff on here. That's very cool. And uh, maybe you'll see me, maybe you'll see me winning the Bassmaster open in April. That'd be cool. <laughs> Dude. I, I hope you come to possum kingdom. I I'm, I'm more excited about that now than, than I, I realized. I, I didn't know that was something you were considering. I mean, I, I think that would be freaking awesome for, for, it would it would at least, it would be funny. It would be funny. You know, me and Archie out there, are out there doing our thing. Hanging a, out. You know, yeah. Yeah. But just in a, a more intense setting. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely. I'm, I'm in dude. But that's, that's awesome. I, ho I hope you show up. Hope, hope you see you out there. Obviously hope to hope, hope to meet you in person. We can, we can hang out mm -hmm. and, uh, th thank you. Thank you for coming on the podcast. I think this is a, a fantastic episode, so I'm I'm excited to see the the feedback, especially at the end, because I know there's gonna be some people that that uh I'm, we're gonna have to clip clip that part where you're like I'm I'm thinking about showing up because if I show up I'm I'm gonna win I'm that's that's awesome that's gonna be my favorite clip from this whole from this whole episode. I'm going to man. I'm deadly. I can float. <laughs> uh, absolutely, it comes full circle. If you can float, you're deadly. You can float. You're deadly. That's my last words. Thank you guys. <laughs> <laughs> thanks marshall we're gonna hop off here shout out to everybody that keeps keeps me rolling keeps marshall rolling and uh gl glad to be back and, and more consistent on the road dog train so we'll see y'all out there next event at chick and logan martin after that uh y'all come up say hi we'll hang out and the road dog is out peace out y'all <laughs>